Hey, it's Dr. Cody Rall with Tech for Psych. In previous videos, we talked about how these devices work, what they're measuring, but we haven't broken down the brain waves yet. And I'm sure you've heard different names for these brain waves, things like alpha, beta, data, gamma. What do these names mean in terms of what the brain waves are doing? Well, in this video, we're gonna talk about the different brain waves and how they help us understand mental function in truly remarkable ways. So we've covered a lot of ground in the last couple of videos. We've talked about personal EEG devices and how they work, how they function like a circuit. We've talked about the brain waves that they measure and how we break the brain waves into their individual frequency components using mathematics like, like the fast Fourier transform. In this video, we're gonna take a look at the individual frequency components. Remember, you take the raw EEG signal, put it through mathematical formulas, and get different ratios of different brainwave frequencies. And you've heard of these frequencies before. They're the brainwaves that people talk about that are uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. And in this video, we're gonna talk about the evidence that's been collected over the last couple of decades. Scientists set up experimental conditions where people are in different mental states or have different stimuli and they take that information and break it down into individual frequency components and we see different ratios of the frequency de components depending on what the subject is doing at that time. And through that process we've gotten ideas about what different brainwave frequencies like alpha, beta, gamma, delta do during mental states, at, during different mental states. So we're going to take a look at each one of these and um, look at what we know about them. One common theme that you'll see with these brain waves is that the slower oscillative patterns tend to have higher amplitude on the EEG signal, and that's because they're typically firing in synchrony. Remember that there's electrical activity going on all throughout the brain, and that the smaller, quick, high oscillative patterns tend to be more random. They tend to be taking care of individual processes all throughout the brain. And because of that, they cancel each other out on the EEG signal whereas the slower cortical oscillations tend to group all these processes together to create a complete sensory experience for us. So the grouping together of all the faster oscillations with the slower oscillations means that the slower oscillations are firing more in synchrony, which means they have higher amplitude than the faster oscillations that are canceling each other out. So we'll start with the slowest brain rhythm, which is delta. Now depending on who you talk to, delta can range anywhere from zero to four hertz. And a hertz is a cycle of seconds. So if you think about it, a delta brainwave could be firing only once per second, which is pretty interesting because if you think about biological rhythms, if you think about how fast the brain is in terms of computing speed, you know, we typically think of the brain as the supercomputer. Yes, it's a supercomputer, but it does have these oscillative rhythms that fire only once per second, which is interesting to think about. Now, delta is really interesting because if you take, say, a neuron and separate it from the rest of the neurons and the brain and just put it in a, detri in a petri dish, the neuron will just fire within a delta frequency, which means that in terms of biology, in terms of the electrical potential within neurons, delta is sort of the default state. It will just sit there and fire at that, at that rhythm. And uh, delta is seen a lot in sleep, in people that are in comas, and also, if someone gets like a traumatic brain injury, let's say um, someone's at war and they get a bullet to the head, but don't die, and a lot of brain, issue, brain tissue gets uh, damaged, um, you'll see a lot of delta activity in the brain, which is, which is bad, because it means that the brain tissue is not up to speed, it's not computing things, and it's not helping people navigate through the world. So delta is kind of this default state that can be bad if someone's supposed to be awake and alert. You also see it a lot in people with ADHD and learning disorders, which means that when we do neurofeedback training, when someone's getting feedback through either uh, a game or a picture, what will be rewarded is lower delta frequencies because as the people concentrate on the game and lower their delta frequency, they're training their brain to compute faster. So we will reward that on neurofeedback training. So the next brainwave is theta, defined as between four and eight hertz. Theta is typically thought of as a transitionary brainwave pattern between uh, the slower delta brainwaves and the more intermediate brainwaves like beta and alpha. Uh, theta typically associated with drowsiness, 
if you think of um, maybe you're in sleep, you got a high ratio of delta, and then you kind of wake up and you're drowsy. And before you're really awake and alert and can focus on things with beta and alpha, you go through this transitionary theta state. There's a lot of folklore with theta. Some people claim that it's really good for creativity. So I've heard people say that they like to do creative writing right when they get up because their brain is still within this theta state, allowing them to be more in this flow state, this more free association state that allows them to be more creative. And that maybe checking emails first thing in the morning ruins that because checking emails clicks your brain into this alpha beta state instead of being in that free associative theta state. Uh, and more folklore with data, some people think that it actually blocks the retrieval of memory. So if you're trying to remember something, maybe you're talking to someone and get a little nervous and can't remember someone's name or the name of a place or an event, you might have theta blocking, which is blocking that retrieval between, say, your hippocampus and your cortex where the long-term memory is kept, which means that you need to go walk around and do something for a while to get your brain out of that brainwave state so you can remember that specific information. So a lot of random theories with data, but typically, again, it's thought of as more of a drowsy state. I know that uh, we use theta to beta ratio typically to help with ADHD neurofeedback because beta is more of an active state for concentration, whereas theta is showing more um, drowsiness. So a ratio to beta to theta is a good measure of uh, how active someone is currently being. So that beta to theta ratio is often used for neurofeedback for disorders like ADHD. So the next brain wave is alpha. Now alpha is a really popular one. It's between eight and 13 hertz. And the reason why it's really popular is it's been very heavily associated with meditation in the past. Researchers noticed that when you get really focused, when you get really intense, a lot of the brain waves like gamma and beta, the faster ones go up and alpha goes down. But alpha is still this awake state. So it was thought of as this wakeful mindfulness or meditation. And it has been heavily associated with meditation. In recent years, that's uh, been more complicated with more findings, but people still use alpha to theta ratio to measure uh, levels of meditation. So you definitely can think of as alpha as like more of a meditative state. Now, like any brain rhythm, alpha is found all throughout the brain. And in different areas, it can mean different things. In my previous video, I talked about when you close your eyes, there's actually a big up spike of alpha activity in your occipital cortex, which is right on the back of your head and is used for visual processing. It's theorized that when you're not taking in visual information, the occipital cortex just goes into alpha rhythm state as a default. You also find a lot of alpha activity over your motor strip, which is right here. It's the area of your brain that helps control your movement. And the crazy thing about the, the movement is that even when you close your eyes and imagine movement, it changes the brain waves in that area. So the alpha rhythm in that motor cortex is either called mu rhythm or SMR rhythm, which stands for sensory motor rhythm. And they're just fancy names for different uh, frequencies within the alpha state found in that area of the brain. But it's good for neurofeedback because if you're sitting still, SMR will go down which means you can reward that for people with ADHD and epilepsy in neurofeedback. Another great thing about it is uh, if you were to install a uh, chip on someone's motor cortex, you could use that for brain computer interface. Remember I said that even if you imagine a movement, it will change the electrical frequencies there and the alpha range. So if you are uh, perhaps paralyzed and sitting in a wheelchair and you're imagining moving your arm you can actually perhaps move a pointer on a computer screen or even a robotic arm that's attached through that brain computer interface chip. Our next brain wave is beta, and that's between 13 and 21 hertz. Now in beta, you're really figuring things out. You're very focused. There's a lot of high analytical thinking going on with beta rhythm. A lot of beta activity in the frontal lobe here, which makes sense because your frontal lobe has a lot to do with executive function, and executive function has a lot to do with figuring things out. Now, typically with beta, it can be associated with high performance, but often it's associated with anxiety. In one of my previous videos, I talked about the default mode network in flow state. And with the default mode network, it's a network in the brain that kicks in when you have referential thought, self-referential thought. You're thinking about your own uh, problems, your trials, your tribulations, you're worrying about things. And with that, there'd be a lot of beta activity. So typically with neurofeedback training, we tend to reward lowering the beta ratio because often it makes people feel better because they're not as stressed out. The last brain wave that we're gonna talk about today is gamma. Now gamma is a huge range. It's anywhere from 30 to 80 hertz. 
And there are brain waves that go up to 500 hertz, and these are very fast oscillations. But the thing is, although these oscillations are very heavy in neuroscience, that they're having all, happening all throughout the brain and are very interesting, we don't have much use of them for neurofeedback at this point. Perhaps in the future we will. But you can think of gamma as all these subconscious processes that are happening all over the brain, these very fast calculations. It's almost like pre-consciousness. And it takes these slower oscillations that we talked about before to rein them in to create a co coherent picture that we call reality. All right, so that's all the brain waves that I wanted to cover today. In the next video, we're gonna take a look at Z-scores. Now, Z-scores have been created through massive pools of brainwave data from normal individuals. It's creating these uh, norms of brain activity that scientists are now using to help people with anxiety or ADHD or any other mental disorder to help normalize their brain waves and help improve their mental function. And we're gonna talk about that in this next video. Thanks for listening.